My name is Kay. I was born Kay June Murphy on the 11th of November 1957. I think I was born at 9.30, but I don't remember if it's morning or night. One thing I remember, well, I don't remember because I, obviously I wasn't there, but the nursing home where I was born was in the same street where I actually lived. And my mum's best friend, Auntie Iris, walked her up to the nursing home whilst she was in labour and left her there, obviously, and she had me. That uh, nursing home is now a block of flats. My father had a crush on somebody called June. And he wanted my first name to be June. And my mum said, you can't call her June when she's born in November. So June became my middle name. And to be quite honest, I don't know where Kay came from. I don't have many memories up to the age of five, six. There's some little flashbacks, but not what I'd call a proper memory. But one of the things I can remember is my dad taking me on the galloping horses on Barry Island, the fairground ride. He had lots of friends on the fairground as well, so he probably didn't pay. But I remember him sitting behind me, holding me on as we galloped around and around and around. The house I grew up in was 138 Woodlands Road. It was, although I didn't realise it at the time, it was quite. A, it was a large house in comparison to a lot of others. It had a front room, a middle room, a back room, and a very small kitchen when I was small, which was changed a bit later. An outside toilet also. Then upstairs were three bedrooms and the bathroom was converted from one of those bedrooms also. And the front bedroom, when I came along, was uh, converted into two, because there were so many of us living in the house. There were lots of us family-wise, but also there always seemed to be someone living with us as well, like, um, they called them, not lodgers, but something like that. They used to come for the summer, some people, and we used to take a lot in. And also my uncle lived with us at some stage, my nan lived with us at some stage also. I think my parents met in Bindles, which is no longer here again, which was a dance place. Um, my dad, Bill, was a few years older than my mum, Evelyn. And I think it took him a few times to be able to to get her to dance with him. quite sad actually because I can't remember them being together at all. I can remember one and I can remember the other separately but I don't remember them ever being together. From what I've been told by my siblings my dad was the firm strict one. As I was growing up with just my mum I think because she was that bit older uh, she wasn't very, very strict with me. But I do remember her smacking me once when I swore. I was pretending I was and I was singing a song, but I kept putting in a swear word, trying to show off in front of my friends, Carol and Dale. Uh, I do have a vivid memory, however, of my dad smacking my brother and sister. I don't know what they were doing or what they'd done, but I remember them both having smacks from him. Did your parents have a good marriage? I, do you know, I don't know. I really don't know. They seem to me happy enough. 
but it's not something I was really aware of. Uh, some things have been said to me that's made me think they weren't. He was a bit of a gambler and a bit of a wide boy, so I think money was short, so that could cause tension, obviously. But I'd like to think they were very happy. Uh, my dad got work when he could. He was very soft, my dad. He'd been in the Merchant Navy. Um, he'd been all around the world, as far as I know. There's a funny story, actually, of him going to Australia. He walked into a bar there, wherever it was that they'd landed, and somebody said to him, Oh, it's Alf's brother. His brother had been there previously, a year or so before, and they recognised him as being his brother. So the inf infamous family. Um, he worked on the docks, which most men did in Barry in those days. They had to have a special card to be able to get work there, and they'd have to go and line up every day to see if there was any work for them. My dad being very soft, he gave his card to his brother, who had a back injury, um, so he could get the work. So very often, my mum said, my dad would go home and say, no work again today. In all honesty, I don't know where the money came from. I felt we were poor in comparison to others because I always had cast off clothes from anywhere. But it was still a happy place. It was a happy childhood. Um, again, I wasn't really aware. We were well fed. So, yeah, didn't feel any different to anyone else. The money would be spent primarily on food. Mum's great thing was cooking and making sure we were all well fed. It didn't go on clothing or treats as such. It, it was, we had little, put it that way. We, we didn't have much money. But again, it didn't feel that way because I had everything I wanted. Mum had two children that she lost. Uh, which would have been my eldest sister and the third born. They were both quite old. They were people in their own rights, as in they were one, two, nearly two. Died from something which today would have been treated easily. So my eldest sister, who would have been the second born, was, is, I'm not sure what year she was born. I have to work it out. She's 16 years older than me, so she's 76. Then came Annie, who is 10 years older than me. Um, so she's 71. And then Phil, the only boy, who is eight years older than me. And he's coming up 70 this year. I don't remember Noli being at home at all. She got married when I was three. So I really don't remember her being in the house, apart from later times when she was coming home with her own, her own children. Annie I was very, very close to. She used to take me out a lot with her and her boyfriends. I used to like to copy anything Annie did. If she was sitting down reading a book, I'd turn my pages the same time she did, turned hers, cross my leg the same time she would. And Phil, when I was born, Phil said, not another blooming girl. So I tried to change myself to be boyish, to please him, and I'd memorise football cards for him to test me. The only grandparent I think was living when I was born was my nana on my mum's side, N Nellie Hollins. I remember her being a little, tiny little woman. Um, she did live with us for quite some time. She was very bad with her nerves. Apparently, another memory that I don't know, when my sister Annie was going out once, she ran after her, she wanted her to stay in the house because she was worried about her going out. She'd also, um, been running up and down the street naked and she was sectioned twice, bless her. Um, she lived in our middle room for a long time. I used to like to sit on her lap and we'd sing songs like, Oh Mr Porter, what shall I do? I wanted to go to Birmingham and you've taken me off to crew. Went into hysterics and I cried in vain. Mr. Porter, what shall I do? I want to go to Birmingham, they're taking me on to crew. Send me back to London as quickly as you can. Oh, Mr. Porter, what 
know what a silly girl I am. She also had a little cyst on the top of her head. I say it's little, it was quite big actually. And I used to like pressing it because it was soft and gooey. Bless, bless her heart. Um, one day, she used to eat her meals in her, in her room and she came out the one day and she hadn't finished it and she'd always eat all her meal. And it turns out she was choking on a piece of beef. So we man mum managed, she had to get help, I think, but she managed to uh, get that out. But with, she obviously was getting dementia and she did go into a home in um, Dennis Powers, which is no longer there. Did you have any nicknames as a child and where did they come from? Or I wanted to say out? more about the Murphy name. Well, carry on with it. Sorry. <laughs> la, 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 la. Murphy name, go. <laughs> One of my family, um, and my sister also, but also my cousin Natalie, have traced the family tree, the Murphy family tree. And it came to a halt in, I'm not sure what year, but the one, I think it's Alf, his name is down as Morris, as opposed to Murphy. So we don't know whether there was a changeover of names, because obviously we always thought we were Irish, but it turns out it's not, we weren't Irish. The family came from Somerset. So where the Morris Murphy came, change came, we really don't know. It's, not, it's something we can't get to the bottom of. Obviously, we've had our own thoughts on this. Maybe they were in trouble and they looked to change names so they couldn't be found, you know, escaping something. It's something I don't think we'll ever know. But as weirdly as it happens, one of my dad's... Um, I think it's his discharge from the Merchant Navy certificate or one of them. Yeah, actually, his second name was Mons, M-O-N-S, which is the in France, I think, the country. Um, his second name they put down as Morris, spelled differently, because the surname Morris was M-O-R-R-I-S, and in the Morris, in his certificate, they put M-A-U-R-I-C-E. Just, just a strange, strange coincidence. Um, as a child, I must say, I was, I think, I was naughty in. When I look back, I was very naughty. I used to push the limits quite a lot. I used to climb onto my wardrobe and write on the ceiling. Um, I'd write on anything, actually. I don't know why. Perhaps I was going to be an author. Um, I, I, my poor mum, I think I drove her round the bend. Um, I was good in school, to a point. Um, my favourite place to hide was the shed. I loved the shed in the back of our garden. I used to do a lot in there. My friends used to come around. There was that, that age, 10. We had, my friend Carol and I had boyfriends, um, Carl and Tino, and they always, and Kerry used to come as well. And they we used to hide in the shed. We'd be there a long time. Although, the shed was my brother's best place for hiding his secret stash of cigarettes. He didn't actually put them in the shed. He had them in a wall somehow behind which I found out, and he told me if I told anyone, the fairies would come and take him away. So I never told anybody about that. I can't remember having pocket money, but if I did have money, it was given to me to go to Saturday morning pictures. I'd often go on my own, because you'd know other friends would be there. It was probably something like sixpence or maybe a threepence to get in and there'd be a few films they couldn't have been that long as films are these days but there used to be a, maybe a small cartoon and then something else and then a film I remember going once when it was possibly Christmas and they were selling or they were giving you a big ice cream as you went in as well in my mind it was like a huge ice cream but it probably wasn't that big I once went to the Saturday morning cinema also with my boyfriend, Stephen, who'd asked, he plucked up the courage to ask me to go. But on the way, he said, if anybody asked, I had to say I was his sister.
my sister Annie was my my role model, I would say, and then Phil, obviously, to a certain degree, with me wanting to be a boy. Uh, as in famous people, it was probably the man from Uncle. I didn't, no, I didn't really have favourites, favourite teacher. In the juniors, which obviously before the age of 10, for the first two years I had Mr Jones, and the second two years I had Miss Jones. Miss Jones was lovely, she was strict, but she was lovely. Mr Jones caused me great problems in life. I look back at things that he did and said to me, and they moulded who I was or am today. As in, he was weighing us all for a project. And my friend Carol and I were at the end of the queue, waiting to be weighed. And he said, when it was our turn, here come the heavyweights. I've spoken to Carol about this recently, and she said she can't remember, or, and it didn't have an effect on her, but to me it did. It made a big, great thing in, in my life about weight. Purely from one one statement a teacher made. He also, um, one day was going around the class asking what fathers did for a living. And he came to me and I said, I haven't got one. And he said, well, what did he do? I said, I don't know. I was six when my dad died. Didn't know. That's had a great effect on me as well. I tell him how he made me feel. What he said, things he said, what they did to me. In fact, his daughter works in education and I've bumped into her a couple of times and I think I would like to tell her actually what he did to me, what it did, what he said did to me. I have lots of happy memories, but one that stands out possibly would be visiting my sister who lived in Ipswich. Um, it was just lovely being with her because she had two children which were closer to my age than my actual siblings. Um, they had an air raid shelter in the back, their back garden, which was down underneath the ground. I used to love playing in there. Sounds like I was a bit of a solitary child. I was in a way, but I did like the company of others. But being in Ipswich, it just seemed different. Maybe getting away from home. Home was happy, but I also had sad memories. Obviously, this was not long after Dad died. Um, and it was a lovely place to be. The saddest memory would be the day that Mum told me my dad had died. As I say, I was six. So... I don't know whether a six-year-old really takes that in, that then the Dad's never coming back again. Uh, after Mum had told me, she told my sister to take me to Smith's and buy me a book. I chose a Janet and John Green book, which I still have to this day. It helped a bit. My dad had bowel cancer, which again today could have been probably treated. But in the 60s, it wasn't the same medicine, same treatments. Christmas in our house was a big family affair. Everyone used to come for Christmas. Often at Christmas also, my Uncle Peter, who lived in Germany with his German wife, would either come over or send us a parcel of German food, which was huge and very, very nice and different, like uh, special holy cheese and black bread, uh, lots of different chocolates. The best gift. Ooh, now this is a hard one. It's either between my man, man from Uncle uh, Kit, came in a black case, had a gun, two guns actually, uh, <laughs> and a holster, and a passport. I love my man from Uncle Kit. Or my patch doll, which I still have to this day. And I still have some of the bits from the man from Uncle Kit as well.
I always knew I wanted to work with children, even from a very small age. I don't know why, it was just in me. I wanted to be with and work with children. I used to go to Sunday school and every Christmas we'd go to a home in Dennis Powys to give presents. And I, th I always wanted to work there. And in fact, I did go for an interview. I was too young, I think I was 14, 15, and they let me interview, like, just for the experience, I think, more than anything. But in my heart, I always wanted to work in Ardwin. And I did go on to work with children. Um, alongside that, I always wanted my own children. Even from a young age, I wanted my own children. Abba Van was a big thing for me. Watching that, I saw it on... I, I assume I saw it on TV. I must have done. And it was harrowing, because I was the same age as those children that died in that school. So it did, that did have a profound effect on me and maybe caused some of my anxieties, I don't know. Uh, you'd think that my dad dying at a young age would make me think more about death, which he probably did, but then that was another one. You think about going to school and never going back. So maybe that was on my mind a lot as well. Another momentous memory, occasion in my life, was when I was 11-ish. Um, my mum remarried. His name was Alf. And he had two children, Glyn and Caroline. And funny enough, Glyn had been in my class through, throughout school. So we were f kind of friends. And then we became step-siblings. Um, I remember the day they told me they were getting married. We were on holiday in the Isle of Wight and we were told. So I said, well done and smiled and ran off and cried where they couldn't see me because I wanted my mum to be happy, but I didn't want another dad. I wanted my own dad. Alf was very, very quiet. Um, he, he was a lovely, lovely man. He was very generous, but quiet. So we didn't really have much of a rapport together. But um, he was, yeah, he was a nice, a nice dad, nice dad. And he was lovely with my mum, so they were happy. He, um, he, he persevered a lot in life. He passed his driving test after about five attempts and he also tried to do an accounting course and he failed that I don't know how many times. I'm not sure if he actually passed in the end. But yeah, lovely man. I was a very naughty teenager. Yes, I did get into trouble a lot. Um, 
when we, me and, me and my friends, started going out, we were 14, we were to go to play, a place called Social Service Social, I think it was called. It's the first time I got drunk. Um, we moved on then to the Friars, drunk again. Butlins, drunk again. Um, I used to walk home on my own early hours of the morning and I look back now and think, oh my gosh, what could have happened to me? I always think I had a guardian angel watching over me. Um, got into trouble once where I went, I don't even know who it was, two boys in a car driving, myself and two friends. And we, they were gonna, we said we were going to London. We didn't go to London, we had it at Holth Curry Park. And just, we were, we were just sitting there chatting actually. And police came and they poked their head through the car and said, Yo, what are you doing? Nothing. How old are you? 16, 16. How old are you? 15. Should be home. So, friend with me, Carla, said, I'm staying with her tonight, so police took us home to my house. So we went in, waited for the car to go off and went back out again to somebody, somebody's house. So I got home in the morning and mum said, police have been here, um, I've got to ring them to say when you're home. Which she did, police came round, very, very embarrassing. And again, poor mum, I do feel sorry for her. But that was it, nothing, That was it wasn't serious trouble. The music we really liked were, was, was Motown, that was, that was our era I suppose. Although we did go through phases of other things, with the clothing that followed the music more or less, um, with the Motown we wore um, skinhead suits, which was a material called, um, it was called tonic, something. I used to go in different colours, in, in the shade. So I had a skinhead suit, which was jacket and skirt. We used to wear stay pressed trousers, brogues. My brogues I painted silver and I had lots of studs on the bottom. Um, my mum never said anything about what I wore, never. She didn't say, that's too short, that's too long, anything like that. Um, we also went through a bit of a phase where we wore, I say we because this is me and my, my gang, my friends. Uh, we wore maxi skirts, so it was a bit hippie-ish, but that, that didn't last for long, that one. And then they went to midi skirts. And midi skirts with a slash down the middle with like a mini one underneath. So we covered everything really. Uh, my favourite would probably have to be this, the skinhead era. I like that that clothing with Ben Sherman shirts. I wore my Ben Sherman shirt which I bought in Cardiff Market for years and years and years. And in the end I'd throw away because it stank so much under the arms. You're standing at the school gates in your last um, day of term. And it's the last day ever of your school career. What dreams did you have at that school gate and how did you feel? Now this, it would be very different if we'd gone back a year because I went to the grammar school, which was amazing. In our last year, the fifth form, it transferred to Bryn Hafrin, where we were mixed with two other schools, secondary schools. So that last year of school wasn't wonderful. We were competing with others to be not what they thought we were, as in grammar school snobs. So not a lot of work was done that year. So actually, if I was standing at that gate now, I'd think, be thinking, I wish I'd worked harder. But at the same time, what I was thinking was, thank goodness I'm out of here, on to the next. I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd applied for a college, which I didn't get into. Um, and I didn't have a clue what I was going to do, but I was going to be working in Butlins. So that was my next step, and I was really, really excited about that.
Yes, I did go to college. I didn't want to. To be honest, I didn't really think about what I was going to do. It wasn't just wasn't in my mind at all. But my mum knew what I was going to do. And she said, you need to go to Barry College and I'm going to put, get you onto this pre-nursing course. I didn't want to do it because it was her idea. I didn't want to do it. But it was the best year of my life. I met some friends that are friends for life again. From that year, I did again apply to Colchester Avenue and I did get in the second year. And I was there for two years and passed. With my college course, we were also employed. So we were learning on the job. My first post was in Holton Road School, which is where my granddaughter now is, many years apart. I we used to go uh, every other week, so a week in work, a week in college. We were also salaried for this. I did find it quite hard in the school. The teachers were a bit... I, won't, I don't want to say snobby. They looked down on me, put it that way. You wouldn't sit on someone else's seat in the staff room. Um, they did warm to me a little when I bought cakes for my 18th birthday. But I didn't have a good report from that. Um, I thought I was doing a, a very good job. They said I didn't socialise with them, but I didn't feel feel that they gave me the opportunity to. And because of the staff room situation, I used to stay out with the children a lot during uh, lunch times. So I think that went against me slightly. The second year, I was in a nursery school, which was better. Staff were nice, smaller staff, so um, nicer in a way. The head teacher had been there from the year dot. Apparently, it was opened in the war and. Lots of children used to go to nursery because of the social element of it. Um, and she used to take a dog to school, a dog called Sandy, who was like um, a collie. And you always know what knew when Sandy was around because because he smelt. But it was a, it was a nice place to be. And when I finished my course and I passed, they offered me a job because somebody was retiring, which I took. So I went back the following September. It was after I got married in the, in the summer and I left at the Christmas because I was pregnant. My job title began as nursery nurse. By the end of my working life, it changed to LSA, which really hurt me. On my certificate, it says nursery nurse. I didn't want to be an LSA. That's not what I, I was or trained to be. And in fact, LSA, Learning Support Assistant, wasn't actually the job that I was trained to do or did. I was actually teaching children. I'm not saying I didn't like that, because I did, I loved it. The, the whole aspect of taking a, th a three-year-old and hopefully not moulding them, but setting them on the right path for the rest of their life, to me, was an emotional event. When I look back at it and I see some of these children now are in their 20s and I see some of them and I think, oh, well done, you did it. Myself and the child did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I met my husband in the Commodore Club in Panath. I used to go there every Saturday. 
sometimes in the week as well because there'd be special do's on. I'd actually had my 18th birthday there as well and I met him in the February after, something like that. Um, he stood out because he was standing on a chair doing a stupid dance. He was good looking. Um, I chatted to his who he was with, his friends, the week before. He wasn't with them that time. And the one of them turned out to be our brother-in-law because he married uh, Lee's sister, eventually. I suppose one of the things that stood out, that he, he seemed bubbly. He seemed of good character. Some of the things that went sour later on because of the same things, possibly. But that was it. I met him that night. And then the next day, him and his and David picked us up, myself and my friend Lynn. And that was it, really. That's we were kind of together since since then. We got engaged on my nineteenth birthday. It was my idea. I think I even bought the ring. Problem was, you see, I was scared I was going to be left on the shelf. So when someone came along, I'd had boyfriends, but nothing solid, I suppose. And I, I was only 19, like I said, 18, 19, and I thought I was going to be left behind. So when something came, and I did love him at the time, I suppose, and um, I grabbed onto it. Uh, two months before the wedding date, Lee, my intended, hadn't turned up. He used to come to my house daily, evening, every evening. Hadn't turned up for two days. Um, he, I, I rang his house, or all, all, all sorts kicked off, but he was having second thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I went to his house the next day. He'd been out the night before. Uh, he, he drove me home. We talked and he said he was going to think about things. He rang me, he went, I don't know where he went, but he rang me the next day and he said, okay, we'll get married. Uh, that was a big turning point in my life, really, because I can't say I'm not glad we got married because I wouldn't have my kids. But um, it was a big turning point in the way I felt about him. That's, that stands out in my mind, that phone call. I was 19 when I got married. Uh, we got married in St David's Church in Ely. Because Lee lived in Ely, he wanted it to be there. Um, we had a coach then. We didn't go in the coach, we went in a wedding car. In To Sully Plastics, where my sister, two sisters, had had their... I should, I'm, two, you know, I'm, I'm confusing things now because my stepsister did as well. And we haven't mentioned her yet. Um, anyway, Sully Plastics, it was very nice, uh, it was a lovely day, it was sunny, uh, Lee's dad wanted to watch the cricket outside, so I think that said something about our marriage. Um, in all in all, yes, it was a nice day, I loved my dress, it was made for me by a lady who mum knew, it wasn't white, <laughs> it was cream, I had a skull cap with a bit of a veil, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a nice day. I didn't, I never wanted a white wedding dress because I was so pale. It didn't have anything to do with, um, sexual activity or anything like that. Um, but it was, I liked, I liked it, the cream. I always said I wanted a cream wedding dress, so that's what I had.
Haley was born on 29th of July 1978 at 01.38 in the morning. I don't know how we came to him. I always wanted to call a baby Kaylee. That was my favourite name, Kaylee. But I think it'd probably be worse, weird, because I was Kay and he's Lee, so it would be a mixture of our names. But, you know, I, I wanted that name before I even met him. Um, or Kelly, I liked. I always liked Kelly as well. I don't know how we came around to Haley. I think it was Haley Mills, maybe. We didn't really talk, Lee and I, so it wasn't really a case of discussing names. It was just, I don't know, what we came up with. The second name, Margaret, is a, f a family name on his side. Uh, his mum was Margaret. His one sister's Margaret. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how that came. Joe was born on 3rd of November, 1981. Very poorly, I, I can't remember the time. Um, he was either 7.30 in the morning or evening. Uh, Joe's name is Joseph Patrick William. Joseph, kind of after Lee's dad, whose name wasn't Joe, it was James, but he was called Joe. Patrick was Lee's granddad and William, my dad. Then uh, Claire arrived on the 18th of August, 1983. We were sat in a pub when I was pregnant. It was a pub that actually was next door to us, to our house. And there was a little girl playing around who I think was roughly the same age as Haley, And her name was Claire. And Lee said, that's a nice name. And so she became Claire. She doesn't have a middle name, although we've always called her Claire Bongo. Christmas was lovely with the children, but very, very stressful. Um, worrying about money. Um, they always had mainly what they wanted, although they will tell me they wanted a Mr Frosty. I mean, they never had one. Um, it was stressful in a way because everything was a bit rushed. When we were first married, um, we used to do, or we did do Christmas dinner with my mum. Christmas tea with my sister. But that, that changed because Lee liked to be with his family, so we always had Christmas dinner with his mum and dad. I say with his mum and dad. The men would always go down to the club. We'd eat our dinner in shifts. They'd come back and have theirs. But I've got to say it was always lovely because Beryl, my mother-in-law, was a lovely, lovely cook. One year, however, we couldn't go because Haley was sick all night. She was so sick we had to phone a doctor. So they all went off for lunch where it, uh, Lee's parents and um, Haley and I stayed stayed home. She was on the settee. But as luck had it, that was the first year we had a Nintendo, so we played Mario Brothers all day. Haley, the midwife or the one of the nurses who came around said to me, "You were born to, you're a born mother," and I always felt that way. I, like I said, I always wanted to have children, so everything about it was was amazing to me. Just I loved, I loved being a parent, a mum. Obviously, there's drawbacks because things aren't easy. When they got older, it got harder. When they, I I found when. Um, when a child knows somebody that you don't know, that's when they're starting to grow up, and that's weird. You know, when they speak to somebody when you're out that you don't, you've never seen. That's sort of that growing up phase that, you know, they're not in your control anymore. Things, it had been brewing a long time. But the day it actually came to an end, 
It was very weird. I was sitting on a chair. Lee was sitting, lying on the settee. And he said something like, I fell asleep before I came to pick you up from Skittles the other night. And I said, oh. I thought he said to me, you don't care, do you? And I said, no. But he told me after, he said, you don't care about me, do you? I, and it blew up from there, really. So, that was it. That was probably one of the hardest times of my life, the next couple of years, actually. But came through the other end. You've said that your marriage and relationship changed you. How did it change you and how did you allow it to happen? <sighs> allow it to happen is really hard because it just happened. Um, I was a strong, I felt I was a strong person. But when you get a stronger person um, telling you how to live your life, just went with it, I suppose. I think I was very scared of being on my own. Although looking back, that probably wouldn't have been a bad thing. That's really, it's a really hard one. Somebody's influence on you can actually change your whole personality. I used to be scared for people to speak to me in the streets because I'd have to explain who they were. Um, I do feel very silly now that I let it happen but at the time I didn't have control over it it just happened I think I've got a lot of my dad in me as the cheekiness the outgoing person although in the married years I wasn't as outgoing but I am again now he was a very sociable person um, Mum's very gentle, kind, thoughtful about other people. I think I'd like to say I'm, I've got all those qualities as well. I do things and people say, oh, that's, you like your mum. I say things that she said. We all, you know, the, the same sayings, such as everything happens for a reason. So, yeah, I think hopefully I've picked up the best of their both qualities. Although I've got to say, Mum didn't have any bad qualities. She was wonderful. The th things that brought me most pleasure when I was a child were probably being with my family. When I think back to when we were kind of all together. Um, was probably the the best best time. Obviously, you know, I go back and for my dad being there. Um, so I lived the majority of my life without, well, all my life practically without him. Just the thought that we were all together. Um, and also with that, Barry Island has a big, big impact on my life. Dad used to take me there, and apparently. Although I don't remember saying this, I say to my dad, my mum, sorry, after dad died, let's go over the island, dad, mum, and find me a new daddy. Um, growing up, would have been Lee, my husband, had a very big impact on my life. Uh, he changed, he did change me, but like I said, I can't regret it because I've got my wonderful kids. And now, I've accepted who I am. I don't care what other people think anymore. I could do what I like. Um, I'm not worried about making a fool of myself. So I think age, aging, has had that impact. We went in the team of the year. It was such an honour, but also it was the whole thing that went with it. Standing on a stage in the West End, a stage where I actually watched a show late a year or so after and sitting in that audience thinking I was up there on that stage. So I think it was more the event than the actual honour of the winning that, that makes it that much 
better to me. Passing my NNEB exam and also I did get a type of degree which I never thought I would do in a Welsh bilingualism doodah. Um, I'm graduating with a robe and a gown. Who would have thought Kay Murphy would have done that? There have been a few compliments, but one that stands out, I was working in a school um, with a six-year-old boy. And he said to me, do you know why I like you? And I said, no. And he said, because you like me. The most, oh, been quite a few difficult things. Um, obviously losing my dad. I didn't deal with it because there was no way of dealing with it. Children these days would have counselling, you know, on some sort of help. Um, I didn't. It was almost like pull your socks up, get on with things. That was difficult and it's a big impact on my life. It was very difficult uh, ending my marriage. And it was also difficult leaving my job. And I think sometimes that's given me more grief than, than any, anything else. Because it was my life and it was like losing a part of me. What have you thrown away in your life that you wish you hadn't? Oh my gosh. I know exactly what I've thrown away. When I moved from my house, we had about 30, 30 years worth of stuff in the attic everywhere I had to sort out and that, that was hard but the thing I threw away that I pined for was my LPs, my albums, all David Bowie, um, Carpenters, Rod Stewart, all, all of them, I pined for them especially nowadays when you see turntables being sold again and I look at them and oh if I had one of those I could play my albums, that is one of my big regrets. And what have you held on to that's so important to you and why is it important? Lots of childhood things. Uh, as I said, my Janet and John book, the green green one, I've still got. My teddy bears, I've still got, that I used to teach at night when uh, I was trying to go to, or supposedly going to sleep. I used to keep all of the kids' birthday cards, but again, with that move, I limited it down to their birth cards and their first birthdays, which I've now passed them on to them. I hope they'll keep them and not throw them away. Um, I'm very, very sentimental with things, uh, especially photographs, and I have lots of them. Well, it's really hard to talk about yourself, isn't it? And put yourself out there. But I think I'd say, Kind, thoughtful, funny. And your three worst qualities? Oh, uh, um, I can be very stubborn. I'm not very good with money. I don't know if that's a bad quality, but it's true. And I think I give too much to other people. What do you see? When I look at myself. Mm. I, I see somebody who cut their hair themselves very badly and has made everybody laugh for the last two weeks. I think I can do these things myself and I try them and they are a catastrophe. That's why I'm wearing these glasses on my head indoors because they're holding back the small bits. Um, I see somebody who's lived a life um, I suppose this line associates with stress, but these show that I'm a happy, happy person and I don't, I like to laugh a lot. I know I said as a child and growing up, I wanted children. I do still wish I'd had more, but 
I suppose what I feel I don't have is a close relationship, as in a marriage. I don't have that, that special someone. I have loads and loads of friends. But I don't have that special someone in my life, which I've grown used to being on my own, and I don't know if I could stand anyone else being with me, but the thought is nice. As I was growing up, I think I had lots of inhibitions. I didn't think I was pretty. I felt my ears stuck out a lot, not helped by the fact my brother and sister used to stick them back with sellotape. Apparently I did it to myself by sucking a finger and pulling my, knee, my ear forward. Um, I always thought I was too fat. I still feel that sometimes, um, but I've, I think I've learned to live within myself. And if I'm happy with myself, why should I care if other people don't like it? I've gone stronger, that's what it is. As I was growing up, age was a really worry for me. I used to think, oh, I don't want to be that age, I don't want to be that age. Because it's closer to dying, isn't it? In fact, I used to have terrible worries about dying. Um, I had counselling because of it and medication because of it. Um, I think as you get older, you just get round to the fact that you are getting older. I worry about dementia, although a lot of people would say um, I got it already. Um, I do forget things a lot. Um, and I act the fool, but I don't think that's age, it's just me wanting to be silly. But at the moment, I'm, I'm just looking forward to it. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm still here. They're all milestones, aren't they? Um, I think it was probably in my 20s thinking I didn't want to be 30. But then the more you look at things like that, you think, I'm lucky that I'm going to be 30 because some people don't make it to that age. Um, 40 just went by and passed quickly. It didn't, that didn't bother me. 50 was okay. I had a new house so, and a new grandchild come in. So a first grandchild come in. So that was okay. 60, I had a huge party. So I, I enjoyed the 60. I suppose looking at 70, it's a bit, gosh, 70. But what I always think in my mind is about my siblings being that much older than me. My sister's going to be 80 before I'm even 60-something. So I'm better off than her. <laughs> Sorry, Noli. <laughs> oh, three wishes. Now that's a big one, isn't it? Um, I remember as a child, if anybody said to you, you can have three wishes, you'd wish for a thousand more wishes or a wish a day for the rest of your life, which would be marvellous. Three wishes would be unobtainable, obviously, but I'd love, I'd love to go back and live my life again. To invent, when I was five, to invent medicine to cure my dad so he wouldn't have died. Um, love to see my mum and dad back together, obviously. Love to see my mum. I would wish that my children and grandchildren would be healthy, happy and healthy, and enjoy their lives. And I'd also wish that the world was a better place for them to grow up in. When I was diagnosed with having thyroid cancer, I, I took it well. I didn't take take the news as badly as I thought I possibly would have. All those years I spent with anxieties and worries about death, it didn't seem to faze me. In fact, it taught me that life is for living.
What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you were young? That I'm good enough. I wish I'd known that I am, I'm good enough. You know, again, things that were said to me made me think I wasn't. Um, I'm a, I am a good person, I know I am. And, oh yeah, I wish I'd known that. I'm not to take anybody's crap. Um, I know now, I, I don't have to, and I won't. I want them to remember me as being there to start with, uh, for being warm and nurturing and funny. If I had to choose one moment, I'd go back on those galloping horses and I'd ask my dad to hold me closer than ever. slide down that hill like a slider on a hill right here you go sorry was there anything else to that one <laughs> 